get this computer going. And let me start by saying, oh, I'm really thrilled as I watch people come into the room, how many people there are. Here tonight, and from, uh, I guess, all different backgrounds, I know some of my colleagues from universities in the city are here. My students are here to make sure at least I have some audience. Um, and there seems to be some other people that I don't know as well. And I hope my lecture will be able to connect with uh, everybody at some point. So <clears throat> I will tell you, underlying all of the examples that I'll discuss, I'll tell you why I think there's incredible lessons to be learned from nature once we go looking, things that we wouldn't really expect to, to discover. <clears throat> and what you'll see is I'm not going to give you a whole lot of facts and figures about energy either. I'm, I'm just going to try to tell you what scientists do. So the talk starts with this theme of energy. Janet has already mentioned it. And it is widely known at this, at this time that just in a single hour of the day, there's enough, enough energy coming from the sun to power the world for a year. So there's a lot of energy there, and this is what tantalizes researchers, and this is what's geared up many nations to try to work out how to tap into that. Um, so traditionally, what comes to mind when you think of solar energy, you think of solar panels, where you convert that energy into electricity, and then that would integrate seamlessly with how we use energy today. You can also use that energy, you can focus it in boil water. That's called solar thermal energy. So these are traditional approaches to capturing, capturing that energy. That's not really what I'm going to tell you about today. I'm going to tell you about photosynthesis, some aspects of it. Um, try to tell you um, how to think about it in a different way from what we learned in high school. I'll mention that in a moment. But one of the reasons why photosynthesis is amazing as a solar energy converter is just the scale of this process. So this is solar energy powered chemistry produces a hundred billion tons of biomass each year. That's a number that's really hard to get your head around. Uh, an editor at Nature Physics had a good way of explaining this, and that's every single hour of every single day, that's the same weight as two great pyramids of Egypt, just produced from the sun. Um, so it's inspiring, especially for a physical chemist like me, who really just studies molecules with life, as I'll show you. Um, this biomass conversion, though, what may surprise some of you, it's not just plants that we see on Earth, that produces this biomass or this living matter, but half of that mass is produced in the oceans. So you've all seen seaweed, green seaweed, red seaweed, these kinds of algae. Most of the biomass is produced by organisms we can't see. In fact, if you take one liter of seawater or lake water, uh, and it looks clean, you would probably drink it if it were lake water, but then it will contain about one million cells of photosynthetic organisms. So it's everywhere. Um, now, in terms of uh, how this works and how it's completely different from engineering technologies like solar cell, not just the scale of the solar energy conversion, but these are really robust systems. So it's not just a sunny day where you can convert um, sunlight energy into chemical energy and grow. These organisms grow in all sorts of conditions and varying conditions, and I'll come to that at the end. <clears throat> so, really what I'm thinking about here, and what I want to convey to you is, there's maybe ways that we can learn new approaches in chemistry and engineering, um, and as well as new insights in biology by studying systems like this at the level of detail that I'll tell you about. So this is what I would call bio-inspiration, but it's taking bio-inspiration uh, at least the way I will see it to another level. So what I'm going to do in this particular lecture is I'm going to describe to you what this machine is, this energy converting machine. So I'll try to explain that in plain language beyond what we learned in high school. And what um, I particularly want to emphasize is how do we know how it works? As you see pictures of photosynthetic apparatus in biology textbooks, if anybody has looked at this or you read about it. Um, but where do those pictures come from? How do we know about this? Well, this is what scientists do, and it's actually um, pretty hard stuff. 
and I'll give you some history on this going back a hundred years. Um, and that ties in with this last point. What do scientists actually do in their research? What does NSERC pay for, in other words? <laughs> um, so this is what we learned in high school, although actually not quite in this way. We usually draw this equation uh, where we're told that uh, water and carbon dioxide join together somehow by sunlight and they produce oxygen and sugars. So that's what we learn about photosynthesis. And it's funny when I remember learning that in high school and then a decade later or so, I thought, well, I, I know what photosynthesis is. It's just that equation. But how does that really happen? It's really, really complex process. It involves hundreds of different proteins, at least, assembled in a particular way. And I'm only going to tell you about a tiny part of this process. So you need to appreciate there's a lot more that I can't tell you today. And I can put it in perspective here. So you see how I've drawn it as two interlocking cogs. This is the famous Z scheme, or Z scheme, depending where we're from, of photosynthesis, where there's actually two reactions proceeding in parallel that depend somewhat on each other in exchanging energy in the form of electrons. So one cog is taking carbon dioxide, this is greenhouse gas that everybody makes a fuss about these days with global warming, sucks that out of the atmosphere of a particular enzyme, and ultimately it's converted to stored chemical energy from complex organic molecules like sugars or starch, at least in higher uh, organism photosynthesis. So that's one cog here obviously has really important implications on the whole Earth and the atmosphere, because this is a big sink for carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas. The other cog here is water splitting. Um, made famous, um, or, or more, there's more public awareness of this, I suppose, these days, with the idea that we could make artificial catalysts um, relatively easily. They don't work that well, but they work to split water and produce hydrogen, usually, is what we aim for, which would be a fuel uh, uh, for cars, for instance. But this is done very efficiently, efficiently with an incredible enzyme in photosynthesis, which you'll see on a slide in a moment. I won't mention it, but it's, it's called photosystem 2. So this takes water, it produces oxygen. And before photosynthesis evolved, Three and a half billion years ago, there was no oxygen at all in the atmosphere. That's all come from photosynthesis. And it tells you, and again, on a global scale, how important this is. Now, what I'm going to tell you about, though, is not the cogs, but what drives them. So you've got to spin these around. You need energy to do that, and that's where the sun comes in. So this is how I would think about it. The sun is spinning these cogs around, and I'm going to tell you how that happens. So that's what I call biology solar cell. So <clears throat> where does this solar cell, as they call it, come from? I'll show you a little bit technically what it looks like in a moment. To give you some appreciation for how these things happen, generally, you, if you've ever seen a, uh, a seedling emerge from the earth, it's white, but within Seconds to minutes, depending on the sunlight, you see changes color to green. What happens is a particular sensor in the organism that senses the light, and it switches on a whole set of machinery, genetically encoded um, systems, of course, that assemble the photosynthetic apparatus. And so what's the first thing that they do? They start making a green molecule called chlorophyll. And that's a really important molecule, because that's the one that's catching the sunlight. I'll tell you how that happens. <clears throat> and this, the quest, I suppose, for working out how this, how this works goes back more than a century. I'll give you an example from this fellow named um, Engelman, um, who at the time was wondering, well, how is sunlight used? Is it simply like uh, you imagine focusing sunlight with a magnifying glass? You could, concentrate the energy in burn paper? Uh, is it something like photography, old-fashioned photography at least, where it's simply the energy of the light uh, that, that uh, causes a chemical transformation to happen that's unspecific in some ways? Well, he worked out this is a fairly specific process 
So he took these, you see in the background, these cyanobacteria, which occur as long filaments. And you've all seen this, it's the slime that you see in creeks and on the side of lakes when it blooms. And so he could took, took individual strands of this, he put them under the microscope in water, and he took sunlight, spread the colors out in a prism, and, and projected that onto a strand of this cyanobacterium. And what he saw was that under the blue light, there were bubbles of oxygen, photosynthesis was happening. And under the red light, there was bubbles of oxygen, but not under the light in between of different colors. So what he showed directly there is that there's particular um, colors that resonate with the molecules in these proteins. And that's what initiates photosynthesis. So that's, um, that's a kind of deep observation. Um, at one level, it tells you these days, we would know very clearly that this is a signature of chlorophyll. It captures light in the red, that's why plants look green. It also absorbs strongly in the blue. Uh, it also tells indirectly of the involvement of molecules called carotenoids, which I'll mention later in the talk. But it tells you further that there's quantum mechanical effects underlying this that help molecules absorb light. This is quantum mechanics is all about ladders of states. For those of you <coughs> who, who haven't thought about this for a long time, and you need to think about it briefly, I'll explain this to you to understand these initial processes in photosynthesis. But how I think of a molecule like chlorophyll is it's a tuning fork. Most of us don't think about molecules, of course, I think about them all day. The molecule is a small structure of atoms that contains electrons that are constrained in a kind of wave pattern. And when light interacts with those electrons, it changes the wave. The wave is bent out of shape, it takes another resonating structure. A, bit, a little bit like when you take a tuning fork, bang it on the bench and listen to it. Those vibrations have a particular frequency. And so it's the same when a molecule absorbs light, it will pick up a particular frequency band, color in other words, from the light. So that's why um, these chlorophylls will resonate with red light, but not with green light. So that's how I want you to think about this. So I'm going to take this to some fairly complex experiments in the middle of the talk when I, when I really get to the frontier of what people are working out. That this is a, a difficult concept for those of you um, more from the general public. So this is what gives this green color anyway, is that resonance. That's how sunlight is captured. One thing I will mention just before I move on that's important here is that that resonance, it's a kind of vibration of electrons, only lasts for a very short time. For most of us, inconceivable short time, tens to minus nine of a second or so. It's called a nanosecond. I'll show you much shorter time scales in a moment. But that's the clock that photosynthesis and solar cells run against. You have to take that energy and do something with it, convert it to a more stable form in a nanosecond. So about 50 years after Engelman's work, Emerson and Arnold made a, a breakthrough in, in understanding photosynthesis, or at least deepening the mystery, I would say, at this point. What they discovered was that it takes 2,500 chlorophylls cooperatively to generate a single mo molecule of oxygen. So this deepens the mystery. This has to do with these cogs I showed you before. This oxygen is generated not by a simple, we just say, splitting of water, but you need 2,500 chlorophylls to do this. So this was extraordinary. Researchers puzzled about this for decades. Where are these chlorophylls? Are they floating around? Are they bound in proteins, held in place to do specific jobs? What's their role? Clearly, there's something to do with absorbing the light in the first place. Now, let me tell you right off. Part of this number, in fact, the factor of 10, comes about from the fact that we have to spin these cogs um, five times for each one. We're going to take 10 photons, approximately plus or minus. Um, to spin through the cycle of doing the chemistry. So the solar cell has to be activated 10 times. That means each time it's activated though, it's a group of two to 300 chlorophylls together that are absorbing the light in that resonance and doing something with it, which I'll show you in a moment. And you can, you can actually see, so I'm not gonna show you these really complicated experiments, 
um, and detailed experiments uh, that were done in the 30s by Anderson and Arnold, but this photograph here of a tube um, sucrose, uh, it's a sucrose gradient actually commonly used in biochemistry, where what you can do is you can crush a leaf essentially, take the proteins out of the chloroplast, and you can uh, centrifuge them so you spin the proteins according to their mass. And you just see by the color here, down here, what I'm going to show you on the next slide is just the proteins that contain the very specific solar cell. I'll explain that, what that is. But up here, in this band up here, the dark green, where you see that 95% of what you see outside, the chlorophyll is in these proteins, all they're used is to absorb light and not a solar cell. So let me show you then specifically um, what this looks like at the atomic scale. And then I'm going to step back and I'm going to say, well, where does this picture come from? I'm showing you atoms in this picture. I'm showing you molecules and I'm going to tell you what they do. Now in the rest of the talk will be, well, how do we know this? So this is a picture here of the solar cell in a higher plane or green algae. And this is part of that famous photosystem 2 enzyme that splits water. The solar cell, what I call the solar cell, is just this group of red colored chlorophyll molecules. So each one is the tuning fork with the resonance that absorbs red light. And what you need to do is get these, this pair of molecules called the special pair. It needs to capture the energy of light and that initiates actually the flow of electrons. So the jet is a single electron that travels down this branch and that stores the energy, the energy that from the sunlight was caught in the electrons of the molecule that lasted for only a nanosecond that now stores it as charge which will last for microseconds or milliseconds depending on the series of pathways and that's what spins the cogs that I showed you before. So that's what a solar cell is. Light turns uh, it is transiently stored in molecules and that's used to generate current, which is an electron in the hole. But you see there's a big part of this picture missing. Of course, that's, the, that's part of this 2,500 chlorophyll number Emerson Arnold came up with. So that solar cell is surrounded in the chloroplast, in the membrane, um, by all of these other proteins, which are not solar cells at all which seems strange. This is not how an engineer would build a silicon solar cell. You wouldn't dilute it with other components. Well, what's ha happening here is, the issue is, in biology, you want to be energy efficient, and you want to be, you, you need to be cognizant of nutrients, which can be in short demand, short supply, and high demand, and you need to be efficient in how you construct things. You want the solar cell, it's like an engine, to be ticking over and turning the cogs at a constant rate, no matter what the sun conditions, no matter um, what other conditions that you're facing. And in fact, just in normal sunlight, even on a bright day, the, the flux of photons, the flux of light, is not enough to run that particular machinery. So what you need to do is flank it with these proteins in particular. That was the dark green you saw in the sucrose gradient, which contain each one around 50 chlorophylls. And all they do is absorb sunlight. So they capture the energy of the sunlight. And in the diagram, you see what's going to happen here is that I need to take, if I'm a plant, I need to take that energy from any of the chlorophylls throughout space here. It's localized in a single chlorophyll more or less, and that energy needs to jump through space. As I said, it's got a nanosecond to do that and get to the special pair here and then it can um, eject an electron. And this is some of the fastest processes in biology. And this is going to be jumps that take a couple of hundred femtoseconds. So now we're talking 10 to the minus 13 per second. It's many orders of magnitude faster than anything else in biology, um, or the typical biology. So what I'd like to step back now and say, well, where did this picture come from? How do we know all of that stuff? Um, well, one thing that's really helped is the ability to see at an incredibly detailed level. In fact, what I have here is a photograph taken with electron beams that shows the layout of those proteins. So this can be done these days in electron microscopes. The wavelength of light is, in a normal microscope is way too big. 
It's much bigger than the screen uh, on the, on, with, with respect to the last slide that I had. Electrons have a very small effective wavelength. So it's a bit hard, maybe with the, uh, on the projector here, you see each of these little patches here. It's, it's amplified over here. That's the picture down here. It's called the super complex. That's the picture I showed you in the last slide. You can actually see it with an electron micro microscope. And you can see how it changes under different conditions, different strains of plants, mutations of the proteins that change the apparatus. And this is very powerful, the ability to see. This was initiated, I would say, by Jim Barber at Imperial College, who first had the vision that you can, in fact, do this even in three dimensions, is to construct these images. This is zoomed in on, on the picture that I showed you earlier. It looks blurry. This is a very, very hard experiment. You can fit into these shapes here um, where the proteins, where the atoms would actually go in this picture. And this is, this is actually remarkable to be able to do this. Um, <clears throat> the other um, big advance here is these atomic level pictures that I showed you. So the ability for me to draw a picture like this, this is the light absorbing molecules from a, a, a light harvesting complex like the green one that I showed you from higher plants. This is from another organism called purple bacteria. Um, but you can see every atom in this structure. And it's, it's recorded indirectly by scattering x-rays and then analyzing the scattering pattern, you can reconstruct molecular structure. And there's a couple of Nobel Prizes in photosynthesis for this kind of work. This particular structure, sold by Richard Cogdell, it was his life's work up to that point, it was the first structure of one of these so-called light harvesting complexes that I'm telling you about today. Now, amazing, because of this beautiful symmetry that you see here. This is a biological system that has this ring-shaped symmetry, nine-fold uh, rotation axis, and you see the groupings of the light absorbing molecules, the chlorophylls, and the carotenoids, which I'll mention later. The protein itself, uh, I didn't show in this picture to simplify it. But this really helps scientists because, believe it or not, quantum chemistry uh, provides methods that allow us to calculate the wave functions of electrons. Those oscillating waves I mentioned, the light generates. We can calculate microscopically many of the properties and predict based on the structure, but without the structure, you can't do any of that. <clears throat> um, why do we care about the structure? Well, the structure is that pivot point between observations and between designing completely new systems in chemistry. And to give you one counterintuitive example here, this is the high resolution structure, which we saw relatively recently, uh, seven or eight years ago, I think, for the higher plant by harvesting complex. Again, you can see the atoms. I haven't drawn them all, all in this picture. But what I want to show you is the arrangement of the chlorophylls. Each of these skeletons here, you see in orange, green, uh, orange or green, that's the chlorophyll molecule. That's what's absorbing the light. But look at the arrangement. A chemist would look at this, and some of you, um, you know, with a sense of design, may look at this as well and say, this is a bit of a mess. This can't be something we would want to copy. It's obviously just uh, nature's way of stuffing as many of these colored chlorophyll molecules as possible into this rigid scaffold, which is the protein, which holds it all in place. Well, <clears throat> if you think about this further, the effective concentration of using chemist language that describes the number of chlorophylls here is 0.25 molar. So that's a really dark green solution, as you saw already. If you make a solution of chlorophyll yourself, anybody can do this, at 0.1 molar, much less concentration, even, even weaker concentration than that, and measure what's called the fluorescence. So measure the signature of light emitted from the chlorophyll after, you, after it absorbs light. This is what happens to it after a nanosecond. It's ejected back out as fluorescence. You'll find that that solution will not be fluorescent at all. And there's this process called concentration quenching um, that eradicates the excited states. You don't have a nanosecond anymore to harvest the energy. You have a picosecond, a thousand times less. And so it would not work at all in photosynthesis. You just couldn't get the energy out. 
So there's a very, very specific arrangement of the chlorophylls in this protein that enable those excited states to be harvested. So this is something we can learn from. And this was discovered by Lord Porter and Godfrey Meta um, not long after the first crystal structure was available, uh, or about the same time as the first crystal structure was available in, uh, in any photosynthetic protein. And they speculated on this concentration question, which turns out to be correct. Um, so the next thing I'd like to touch on, though, you can see these structural pictures, so that's fine. I can draw the picture that I showed you earlier. You'll see again in a moment. But how do we? How do I know how to draw the arrows? In other words, how do I know how it functions? So this is a much harder exercise. So what happens after light is absorbed? In other words, is the question here. Um, and this is where advanced methods in physical chemistry come into play, often using lasers because we can pulse lasers in short bursts and that enables us to time processes. But more than that, we need to connect this structure and that's a more difficult exercise. So I want to give you a bit of insight into just what you need to think about if you're going to explore function with these short laser pulses. And I'll show you something that's right at the leading edge of all of this, of this kind of work. So here's, here's what, we, what we really need to do. If we, have this photosynthetic apparatus somehow as a sample that we can study, either in the cell or isolated. I'll show you an example in a moment. What we need to do is take a short burst of light, red light, for instance, that could initiate this light harvesting process, and then we'd like to map out how it moves through space. That turns out to be really hard to do because all of these chlorophylls look pretty similar. Although we actually can construct these kind of diagrams sometimes. You might ask, well, how long does it take to get to, to sensitize the electron ejection in the special pair? And you could certainly ask that question and answer it. And it's all about initiating an ultrafast process and knowing and then timing it and knowing how to detect the products. So I'll give you some <clears throat> some kind of insight into that, but first one comment on how the energy jumps from molecule to molecule. Something that a PhD student at the University of Melbourne showed me when I was an undergraduate. He drew it, drew it on the whiteboard. He was actually explaining how uh, uh, plastic, like polystyrene, degrades in sunlight. And it's, it's accelerated by the same process that's used in photosynthesis to amplify uh, the energy available to these reaction centers, to keep those reaction centers ticking over by, by recruiting hundreds of chlorophylls to catch the sunlight, focusing that energy at, at, at the reaction center. That's this process of energy transfer. And you can think of it this way. Remember I said about the molecule being a tuning fork? It resonates with the, with the light uh, at a particular frequency, and that puts it in this excited state where it stores the energy. Well, because these electrons have changed their wave pattern, they have this kind of oscillation, to quantum mechanical oscillation. They interact with these other molecules here. So they kind of get the electrons in those molecules sloshing backwards and forwards, and that can lead to some chance where you just all of a sudden exchange energy. So it's a de excitation of one, you lose the red the energy of a red photon, and instantaneously at that point in time, it jumps to the other molecule. But this is the hopping that I mentioned, and this happens among the chlorophylls. <clears throat> it is an extraordinary process. There's classical analogs. You can actually do this. I'll talk about tuning forks quite a lot, and another example of tuning forks. You may have seen this yourself. If you take two tuning forks now, and hit one on the counter and listen to the musical note, and bring the second tuning fork close to it, but not touching, because of the pressure waves in the air, you can transfer the, the, the vibration of the musical note to the second tuning fork, and it will now resonate, not the first one. And that's, that's a similar process, but classical. So that's what plants use, but because of the scale of this, very short length scales, and the speed at each of these jumps, I mentioned 100 femtoseconds. You know, the, the, if you want to put this in macroscopic terms, this is incredible leaps, 10 kilometers in a second kind of um, scale. And so uh, so this, is, this is the idea. Now, the last thing we would need to incorporate in the experiments then 
Let's kind of, I'll give you an example of that. Is we need, you know, somehow sense, um, after we set the process in motion, we need to sense, well, what did we, what did, where did we put the energy, and where did it end up? And to do that, we're going to rely again on how different colored molecules resonate differently with light. So they're going to, in other words, have a, have a whole set of musical notes. We just need to tune in our device here to these different musical notes. <clears throat> and I'll show you that in the diagram shortly. And just to bring all of this back to reality as well, because I'm drawing atoms, molecules here. Remember, we're doing these experiments on a solution like this that you can hold in your hand. A colored solution, in this case a protein, is extracted from these algae. When you see the blue color in the algae, there it is in the, in the aqueous solution. So we're doing this experiment on uncountable billions of these proteins. So we're averaging to some extent what happens if one needs to deal with that. <clears throat> that also. So the samples are macroscopic. We're not looking in exactly at one of these diagrams I showed you. Now let me give you an example then of how you can detect these these resonances, the different musical notes that each molecule plays. So here's the absorption resonance, the red resonance. This is a, a scale here of wavelength. The red colors here, the chlorophyll resonating at that wavelength. The blue, or actually the pink protein you saw in the vial on the last slide, uh, over here, that absorbs in the green. That's its resonance here. And what I can do with my short laser pulse, if I tune it to this color, I can strike only those molecules, they're not chlorophyll, as pink molecules, I can strike them with my laser selectively, and then my probe, which comes later and does the timing, it could be tuned for the chlorophyll. And by that, that way I can say, well, how long does it take for the energy to move actually through the cell, through several tens of nanometers, possibly, to move from this light absorbing pigment to the chlorophyll. So that's a simple, a simple example for a scientist. I you know it's still at a complex level, but somebody hasn't thought about what's called spectroscopy. Um, but that's what we do. Um, more specifically, we might do it like this. This is a short femtosecond laser pulse. And we would split it into two with a piece of glass, specially coated. And then what we need to do, we can't use electronics to do this timing, it's impossible. So we actually use the speed of light and we move this mirror physically backwards and that gives timing. So it puts this one pulse ahead of the other. So one pulse, which will start all these events, and the second pulse, which is delayed by perhaps 10 to the minus 15 of a second, will come and we'll do the timing. We'll change that timing delay. And this is a traditional experiment, uh, in which case the sample would be right there. But in this latest version of this experiment, instead what we do is we take that experiment, we duplicate it. So we copy the laser pulses, and we have these two pairs, and what's special about that is the electric fields underneath these laser pulses in the pair are identical. And we need that to get this information. And you see these glass wedges, which are anti-parallel? By pushing them together, you can't even see the change in thickness of glass. But that delays the laser pulses without upsetting their electric field. Uh, and that can give us timing that's 10 to the minus 18 of a second now. And we will we'll scan those timing delays. And we'll do this over and over and over. Well, I won't put my uh, students and postdocs who know how to do this will. well. And they'll set up a pulse sequence, four pulses. And they'll use that to time and process all of that information uh, that, I, that I spoke about qualitatively, at the end there'll be a signal that you actually see coming out of the sample, and you overlap that with this known pulse and analyze it and perform what's called Fourier transforms, and you can generate a map that tells you the different time delays between the pump and the probe, what happens to the energy that you put in at different colors, where did it end up? <coughs> and what that would enable you to do, I have two technical slides here, um, is to draw a, a picture like this that lays out for you in detail after we put energy from sunlight or from the laser in this case, say into the center of this small protein, what are the pathways and the time scales that the energy jumps to the next molecules? And that's all extracted from analyzing these kind of experiments. You see the time scales here, incredibly fast, 
So then 10 to the minus 14 of the second will so. Uh, and then and, uh, up to about 10 to the minus 12 of a second. But combining that information with that, that atomic resolution structure, this meant that this enables us to pull, pull those pictures together that I spoke about. So this is really what scientists do. Now, <clears throat> just to build on that for one second, then I'll show you something surprising. And that is, um, here's a picture of the protein, where we have the atomic resolution structure. And remember, you're thinking of the yellow here as the protein. That's just a scaffold. And what that scaffold is doing is holding in place the colored molecules, which are the light absorbers, like chlorophyll. In this case, they're not chlorophyll. <coughs> Various bright colors. So each one of these is a musical note that I mentioned, because it has that different resonance with the light. And here are the musical notes. So there's, I guess, the chord played by this protein and a couple of lines are drawn here under its absorption spectrum. And that experiment I showed you can generate a map which tells us um, after I strike this musical note, for instance, how long does it take to move downhill to the red musical note? And I'll just sit on a cross peak at those coordinates, I just read off the coordinates, and watch as a function of time in these pictures that signal amplitude growing with time grows in smoothly, just like pouring water out of one cup into another. And that's what we detect. It's pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> what I'll show you though in the movie next is that striking observation, is that what can happen with these short laser pulses is they strike the whole chord essentially at once. So again, coming back to the tuning forks, imagine I have two tuning forks with different musical notes, and this is famous demonstration that uh, your grade two music teacher usually does, I think, at least when I was growing up. Take the two tuning forks, repeat them on the bench, two different musical notes and listen. In addition to hearing the musical notes, you'll hear an interference between them. You actually hear this humming going up and down and up and down. That's a very low frequency resonance. It's the frequency difference between two different musical notes of the tuning forks. Now, it turns out that in these experiments, there's a quantum mechanical effect that can give such uh, a resonance between the frequencies that we can see sometimes in cross peaks, and we can use this experiment to see it. So then instead of um, the, the change in population being like water poured from one cup to another, a smooth exponential rise, we'll actually see this humming, this oscillation of different frequencies. So take a look at the cross peak. Oh, okay, I guess it changed the order of the slides. So you're going to have to wait in suspense. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So we'll look at this movie in a second. I'll show you that effect. Um, I guess what I wanted to do is to tell you where it comes from first, and then I'll show it to you, show you what it's a signature of. Well, here's the, here's the resonance that UV is, it's called ultraviolet visible resonance of a molecule, simple molecule called naphthalene. So that's its musical note. That's how to read this spectrum. Uh, where it peaks, that's where it captures most effectively that wavelength of light. And I usually put this up in my seminars for graduate students as a question, um, because we spoke earlier about moving energy through space, where you would imagine with this molecule, if I could get these electrons oscillating, the energy could jump over and get these electrons oscillating and move through space. That was that antenna effect that's going on in light harvesting. <clears throat> so what would happen though in this molecule if I measure the absorption spectrum? If that, if the theory underlying that makes sense, then it should be identical to what to this resonance. Because either the light interacts with the left or the right light absorbing group here measure this and it's completely different. This is an experimental result. In fact, what you see, instead of one resonance, you see two. And these are called molecular excitons. Um, what you're actually seeing is quantum mechanics in action. What you're seeing is the fact that you can't tell the difference between excitation and that electron resonance being on the left and the right side of the molecule. And so quantum mechanics tells you the correct states Solutions for the famous Schrodinger equation is a linear combination of those two. There's two linear combinations of the positive and the anti-symmetric linear combination. There it is. 
an experiment. So that tells you, in, in this case, that the electrons on those molecules, when they absorb the energy from the light, they actually work completely cooperatively in a quantum sense. You can think of them as oscillators sloshing together, fully coordinated. Uh, so here's the movie. So let me prepare you for it. <clears throat> Remember what we're going to do is we're going to look at the cross peak. We're going to see this evidence for the two tuning forks in resonance. And the quantum effect that we're probing really is related to, um, in some sense, this cooperative absorption of light. The electrons working together on two distant molecules to capture light. And here's the signature of it. You see this cross peak. You see the color of it is the intensity of the signal or the amplitude, and you see it beating. It's oscillating with time up and down. This is a movie just of raw data recorded in the lab. And that's that quantum effect that we've, we've created uh, using the short laser pulse that enables us to probe uh, whether the molecules just act independently, which is what people always thought, or if they're acting together in a cooperative sense, a sense of of excitons or even somewhat slightly more sophisticated versions of that. So that was the discovery. Um, <clears throat> what I want to then finish with is I'll just add something to this from a scientific point of view, and then I'm going to show you some quite different um, aspects of photosynthesis that I'll finish with, which are more of these general um, uh, lessons that we've learned why organisms are not devices. This is the structure of one of those proteins, the blue protein. Like the one, in fact, the one that was giving the oscillations that you just saw in that movie. And <clears throat> this is how chemists and biochemists view protein structure as a tangle of tendrils that create this 3D structure. And these ribbons actually are, of course, uh, molecules in the background of the protein. And it's all rigid and a defined structure. Buried in this protein of the light absorbing molecules. And how to think about it is that there's these two green subunits which can be separate, but in biological systems they're glued together. And in some sense, the glue that binds them with these smaller proteins here holds that complex together. The striking observation <coughs> that we're reflecting on right now is that those oscillations you saw, the quantum effects, which just means molecules are working together to capture the energy from sunlight and redistribute it, is here's some structures of four different proteins from four different species of algae. And you see these molecules at the center where the two proteins, the green proteins come together and they lock like two hands holding each other. That brings those molecules really close together and it turns on the exciton effects, the quantum type effects I just mentioned. And it's a direct consequence of this close distance. Um, another species has the same motif. Again, you see those, those effects in the, in the advanced spectroscopy I showed you, but it's intriguing. Paul Kirby discovered this with the crystal structures in Australia, that there's a, there's a whole, in fact, line of these organisms where because of the change in this very subtle change in the protein structure, one amino acid insertion, those green subunits can't lock together. They're twisted by 73 degrees, and they have a hole in the middle. And so what that does is it turns off the ability to keep um, the electrons coordinated on those two molecules. When they interact with light, there's no quantum effects, no excitons. So nature has the ability, and this is under genetic control, it's encoded in the DNA, the ability to turn on and off this, um, this essentially quantum effect at the level of the protein. And somehow this helps the organism. We don't know how. To finish, I'll quickly mention more. How could you go about working out what this change at the level of one protein does for the organism? How to understand that? Um, and I'll mention right now, this is a big challenge for biophysics in the future. How do you do that? I'll show more explicitly on the next slide. But coming back to these spectra that were recorded for these cells, living organisms, these are experiments done on living algae. Um, we, can, we can do an experiment that will tell us how efficient the photosynthetic light harvesting process is. How efficiently can we get those solar cells ticking over in this organism by exciting in the green and 
sensitizing the, the chlorophyll solar cell, which absorbs over here. So how, how efficient do you think it is? You know, it was sort of, Janet mentioned something at the start, but you'll be surprised. The point of efficiency, so is only about 70% here. 70% of the photons absorbed by this cell end up getting that solar, getting that reaction sent to the solar cell, ticking over. So it's not super high. We've got to start thinking like a biologist. <clears throat> What's the biology that's going on here? Another example, that was, that was for cells grown under the normal light. You see up here, they're the light pink color. These were cells <coughs> grown by Tihana, one of my postdocs, under low light, dark pink color. What do you think the efficiency is there? Now light is the limiting reagent. How many of the photons absorbed would be converted into electrons in this case? More than 70 or less? Actually extraordinary, it seems to be only 50%. So less doesn't make sense until you see the color of those cells or if you're a device engineer and you'll say great <clears throat> you're not telling us the right number you were telling us what's called the internal quantum efficiency that these cells absorb many more of much more of the light that passes through that medium so the external quantum efficiency is much higher in other words more of the incident light is converted to energy in this case <clears throat> so that's just to give you a flavor of how we need to change our thinking when we scale from what these isolated proteins do to what cells do and what biology cares about. If we want to ask, ask the, answer the question, why is, what does this switch from quantum to no quantum do in these little proteins? We need to ask what biology is thinking and what other parameters it's worried about. In, in these different light conditions. So what I've got here is this, this inverted pyramid. This is something Schrodinger was thinking about when he was wondering if quantum mechanics mattered in biology. He was thinking at the top of the triangle in biology, statistics matter. Billions of processes happening together obscure the microscopic processes. But if we could go down to the level of the proteins isolated, like what I showed you we were doing experiments on, he speculated that now rather than statistics, quantum mechanics matters. That was a fairly simplistic point of view in hindsight, but makes some sense. But what I'm saying is now we're pretty good at studying these systems in isolation. We can get a handle on what goes on. But if we want to speculate on what, whether it matters to biology, we need to design completely new kinds of approaches, biophysics, to do that. Because all the information I told you about in my detailed uh, explanations earlier is completely lost when you look at a cell, when you study a cell in any way. <clears throat> so this is a challenge. Um, and just to finish, a couple of different thoughts. Um, again, what's special about photosynthesis? Think of the plant <clears throat> out there in the sunlight can't move. The cryptophyte, the algae that I showed you, they can swim. Uh, the plant can't move. Think of the sun rising, uh, approaching midday, in full sunlight, and then setting again. The, sun, the plants actually have a rhythm that dances with that change in the radiance. When the irradiance is changing by two orders of magnitude across the day. And they will change the photosynthetic machinery, mostly the light harvesting proteins, um, to optimize and protect themselves as a function of the irradiance from the sun. Even more amazing, think of clouds passing the sky. We have bright sunlight here. It changes now by at least a factor of 10 as the cloud passes over the sun. And what do the plants need to do? They need to react on that time scale, seconds or less, to protect themselves. Under the bright sunlight, they're actually damaged the delicate enzymes, the reaction centers, so the engine photosynthesis. So they need to get rid of most of the sunlight, as a matter of fact, under, under bright day conditions. After 11 o'clock in the morning, the plants start shutting down the light harvesting. They dissipate uh, that excess excitation, as, just as, as, as uh, heat, usually. And they do that very sophisticated control feedback regulation loops. Uh, engineers uh, would be inspired by, of course, the engineering of this um, is, is just as advanced. 
So they'll do that by sensing pH changes, sensing the protons, in other words, that you get from water splitting, and working out at what point they have to worry about excess light. They'll actually shift the structure that I showed you in those electron micrographs in some cases. Uh, they'll, they'll chemically change some of the molecules here so that they become safety valves or energy sinks that just take the excitation and dump us at this heat. It's a chemical change in response. So there's all of these pathways. <clears throat> so these are amazing machines. And I'd like to give you, finish with one uh, obscure example uh, that's somewhat related to this. It involves these molecules called carotenoids. Many of you will have heard of carotenoids because they're one of these components in so-called superfoods and various health supplements. So they're free radical scavengers. Um, uh, they're in all of these brightly colored foods, usually the red or the orange color that you see. They're long molecules that look like this for anybody who's a chemist. In photosynthesis, they serve um, three primary roles, and I'll show you a fourth that's really bizarre. Um, <clears throat> they do capture the energy from sunlight. You can see they have color. You see the pictures here. So they absorb light in the blue green. They help. Um, uh, catch more of the sun's energy. More importantly, you know what happens if you take a poster and put it out in the sun? A colored poster? It bleaches. <clears throat> so you don't want that to happen to your carefully constructed chlorophyll containing proteins. They stop that happening. Uh, they're involved in the regulation I just mentioned. Uh, I want to give you then one example. Uh, that's an organism called purple bacteria. Some of you may have seen it. Here it is in the pond. If you've flown uh, over Oakland, you'll often see purple bacteria in the bay um, outside of San Francisco. Here they are under a microscope. They're a photosynthetic organism. <coughs> I showed you already the famous crystal structure of the light harvesting protein from purple bacteria. I want to tell you one weird thing about this that's being discovered. It's on the next slide. But I need to remind you that there's chlorophyll type molecules that absorb, in this case, in the near infrared wavelengths we can't see, and the chlorophylls that you just saw that are capture light in the blue green. <clears throat> and usually in purple bacteria, they take that light and they use it to power the solar cell. So this final example is something that's quite the opposite. It's really bizarre. These black holes of the Bahamas, they're called these water. Uh, big ponds of water, seas of water, that are isolated from the ocean. Um, they're typically characterized by you go down, is it to scale to an airplane, go down several tens of meters where it's fairly normal water, and then you get one meter thick band of black uh, water. It's black because it's full of purple bacteria. They dominate this band of water. And how do they do that? They do it by rewiring photosynthesis. So the chlorophylls, instead of absorbing light and using them to power solar cells, they dump it as heat. And by doing that, they actually physically heat this layer of water by a few degrees. They physically heat the water around and essentially burn off the opposition. And then that gives rise to the, to the, the name of this, the black hole of South Andros. It's black because no light penetrates at one meter thick layer of herbal bacteria. Um, <clears throat> so that's everything that I wanted to say to you. Um, we've gone from uh, plants, where as I said, there's so many photons hitting that leaf per second, they have to worry about getting rid of the energy, uh, to organisms like green sulfur bacteria, which can live uh, deep in the ocean or in mud, where they photosynthesize, essentially under moonlight same conditions as moonlight. And then there's even things like, this is a Christos coralline algae I mentioned in the abstract that live 20 meters under the sea in Arctic fjords, under one to two meters of sea ice, and they photosynthesize. That's at the threshold of this primary production. <clears throat> so there's all of these remarkable examples, and this is what's inspired